see attendees flooding in, which is wonderful. Good morning, everybody, as you're coming in. Uh, welcome to Mornings with Planning, a webinar series hosted the first Wednesday of every month where the Lexington Division of Planning discusses new ways to reconnect, reimagine, and respond in a new reality. My name is Lauren Weaver, GISP and Senior Planner with the Lexington Division of Planning, and I will be your moderator for today's April 7th, 2021 session. This webinar is eligible for AICP credit, and during this special extended session, we'll be, we will be discussing the role of parking regulation reform as we develop and redevelop for the future. Today, we also have folks watching on Lex TV, and you can catch this session again later or share it with a friend or colleague on Lex TV this Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. That's accessible through the TV stations as well as through the internet. And you can also visit our website at imaginelexington.com to see the recording. So kick back with your morning coffee or tea and let's meet today's panelists. Uh, we, have pa we have four panelists today, including Matthew Petty, Council Member and Private Sector Planner with the City of Fayetteville, Arkansas, Nolan Gray, AICP and Land Use Planning Researcher, um, and also a PhD student at the University of California, Nadine Marrero, AICP and Director of Planning and Zoning, Zoning for the City of Buffalo, New York, and Jimmy Emmons, AICP and Senior Planner with the City of Lexington here where we are. Well, I guess where I and Jimmy are because virtual reality now. <laughs> um, before we dive into the conversation, I'd like to take a minute to share with you all some of the takeaways from registrations. Uh, we received lots and in honor of Jimmy's sense of humor, you might say parking lots of feedback and questions from registrants which have been consolidated for our discussion today. So thank you for sharing your thoughts and curiosities. Um, we heard that our communities want more walkable neighborhoods, more housing with less car dependency, accessible amenities, effective parking regulation reform, better use of lots that are currently used for parking, better mobility for the whole community, and economic growth opportunities. You have a lot of curiosities like the impact of the pandemic, strategies for dense development along busy transit corridors, how other places are handling parking and traffic, how affordable housing and parking requirements are connected to one another, and what trends in parking demand currently are. Um, and even more, that's just a, a brief synthesis of some of the things that you shared in your registrations. Uh, audience members in attendance today with us via Zoom, please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A functionality and we'll work to integrate those with the questions that were submitted with the registration form. All right, so let's kick off this discussion. Um, let's begin with uh, introductions from each of our panelists. Uh, and if you could introduce yourselves and give the audience a little bit of background about what your background is and where you're coming from, that would be fantastic. We'll start with Matthew. Uh, from Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, so maybe you can talk a little bit about your role in private sector planning and your role as council member, I think for for quite a, some years now as well. Uh, and I think you were all also involved in parking regulation changes as a council member in your area. Yes, yeah, th thank you, Lauren. I'm, I'm really honored and, and happy to be here this morning. Uh, I'm in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And I've been a council member here uh, going on 13 years. I'm in my, my fourth term now. And we've done um, a, bit, a bit along the way, focus on land use and transportation. And, and maybe one of the most important things we did was we repealed commercial parking minimums citywide, uh, I think about four years ago, maybe five years ago now. And uh, excited to talk about that today. Um, outside of my, uh, my duties as a council member, I'm a uh, planning, uh, I'm an urban planner for the in the private sector and, and work with other cities to uh, lately to help implement pre-approved uh, buildings as a as a program in their cities for addressing their housing challenges. Thank you. Yeah, time just kind of slips away, especially with this weird past gap year. 
<laughs> Nolan, let's uh, go over to you now. Uh, so I believe you were born and raised in Lexington, but you're currently up way earlier than I am over in California. Um, and you're focused in land use research. Can you tell folks a bit about that? That's right, yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here and it's exciting some of the stuff that you all are working on in the planning office. Um, Right, so I'm a, I'm a land use researcher I'm working on a PhD here at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, some of you may know housing costs are a huge issue in California, uh, but uh, less appreciated is the extent to which this is a problem all over the country. So my research looks at the relationship between housing costs and the way that we regulate land. Uh, that includes uh, things like zoning and in particular minimum parking requirements. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to discussing it with you all. I uh, work closely with uh, Donald Shoup, where I'm actually working with him on his uh, his famous parking class uh, this quarter. So I'm looking forward to the conversation and thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. All right, Nadine joining us from Buffalo, New York. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your role in planning in Buffalo and some of the work perhaps that you've done with minimum parking requirements? Great, thanks. Um, I'm. I'm the director of planning and zoning for the city of Buffalo, which means I get to do the fun long range planning stuff and the boring regulatory planning stuff as well. So in 2007, the city of Buffalo adopted a new zoning code, the first overhaul since the 50s and removed minimum parking across the entire city. Um, so the city of Buffalo now has no minimum parking requirements anywhere. Um, so I got to work on that fun half. And now as the director of zoning, I've seen the results of that over the last four years. Um, coming through um, planning projects that have, or development projects and how that's been affected with them. So, um, you know, really what's been the impact on communities and, and development projects in there. So I have both sides of that conversation um, in Buffalo. That's great. Well, thank you. We're looking forward to hearing about those different sides. All of the sides you can offer to this conversation are appreciated. And Jimmy, Jimmy Edmonds here in Lexington, who started as a temporary draftsman, I think. And then uh, you've been in planning for a while, working on development plans and now in transportation planning. Can you tell us a little bit about your work and maybe briefly mention uh, the, the work you guys are doing for parking regulations in Lexington now? Uh, absolutely. Um, kind of like you mentioned, I, I, started, uh, I started with the uh, Lexington's Division of Planning straight out of college. I've been here about 25 years with 18 years of solid development review uh, in different forms or functions. Uh, and the, the last six years, I've been in our transportation planning section. Uh, really, uh, it's, a, it's a group effort, but one of the things that we're looking at uh, in, our, in our parking uh, proposal that we're putting out there is that we, we did a deep dive into our parking regulations. We asked, you know, some really important questions. You know, what are we trying to accomplish with our regulations? What are, what's the intent of our zoning ordinance? Is, is, are our current regulations, you know, allowing or are they hindering the city that we want to be, that we said that we want to be in our comprehensive plan? So we took a deep dive and looked at some of those just very, I mean, very basic questions and, and looked at, you know, what is the purpose of zoning? So. Thank you. Well, audience members, you can see we have a great panel here today and a, an excellent conversation ahead of us. I have way more questions than we have time to answer, and that's an excellent problem to have. Um, let's start with a little bit of a, a lighter um, kickoff question. Um, so I'd like to hear from each of you, um, what is a, a neat or inspiring thing that you've seen emerge as a result of changes to the more traditional car-centric parking regulations? That could be anything. It could be what happened with a parking lot. It could be the change in a neighborhood. The, the sky is the limit. So jump on in. Okay, well, I guess I'll, I'll go first. Um, yeah, I, I confess sometimes I, I feel uh, I'm I'm afflicted where if a little bit of too much time goes past, I just feel like I have to jump I have to jump right in. So I'll go first. Um, uh, we've seen a, a couple of things as a result of repealing our, our commercial parking minimums. Um, there's a lot of examples in Fayetteville of adaptive reuse where we've seen things like 
fast food restaurants turned into dentist offices and things like that. Just kind of um, bread, bread and butter reuse. There's nothing sexy about it. There, there's nothing remarkable about it, but those are businesses that are in locations typically in, in corridor locations where our previous rules would have prevented that um, because the, the prior uses and, and, and parking permits had expired um, from, from disuse. And there's just tons of examples of, of, of those here in Fayetteville now. And, and we have a few maybe more interesting examples for, for, for people that are interested in, in land use and planning um, of mixed use, small mixed use developments, 10,000 to 20,000 square feet in, in total. So not, not, not big, we're talking eight, eight or 10 apartments with a little bit of commercial space on the bottom um, that have been able to, to be constructed since the repeal, just because they, they were able to say, you know what, the street parking is enough for us and we don't even need to really try and figure figure the, the rest out. But I think what has been most remarkable is actually the culture change in Fayetteville. You know, a, a number of years have passed since we repealed the commercial parking minimums. And in the meantime, we've seen some other parking pressures associated with campus uses and in, a, in abutting residential spaces crop up. And we, as a city and, and as staffers and, and planners had a, um, a hope that we might be able to start experimenting with, with some of the more advanced um, uh, parking regulations like uh, changing the pricing uh, on a monthly basis according to demand or, or treating um, re residential areas a little bit di differently in, in terms of the time slots that we impose regulations. And we were really nervous about trying to do those things even though they've been in our parking master plan because the parking politics are, are so hard um, because there's so much emotions wrapped up. But what, what, we've sent, what we found and what I think is really fascinating to us is that the, the culture had shifted because we proved that maybe we, we had some good ideas uh, by virtue of repealing the commercial minimums and, and what happened. And so we were able, with, with some of these more recent, I, I think more, um, more complicated discussions to actually have uh, neighborhoods and, and neighbors kind of lead the way to those more advanced policies and to be actually enthusiastic about it. And, um, you know, what? One, uh, the last time we talked about this and, and we went through this, um, we kind of had two or three public hearings and discussions and work mm -hmm. sessions on what we were going to do for these little residential uh, districts that, that were experiencing some of these more extreme pressures. And at the end of it, we actually got applauded by the neighbors. And I've never seen anything <laughs> like that in all my history. And it was over parking. So yeah, over I, mean, I think there's a lot you can shift if, if you take something on uh, that makes sense at the beginning, you'll be really be surprised what it means for you down the road. That's really inspiring to hear that you can get an applause for parking reform. That sounds like a, something you'd see in a sitcom, not in real life. Um, well, great. I'm looking forward to hearing more about um, the politics involved and the cultural shift as we continue this conversation. And I would argue that dental hygiene is sexy. <laughs> All right, who's up next? What's something neat or inspiring you've seen emerge from regulation reform? Um, so I, I guess I'll go next. Um, Cause I was trying to think of like a cute, fun um, tidbit rather than, you know, grand inspirational. So I'll go with my cute, fun tidbit. So we've had, um, with another piece of code in our, in our new zoning code, we've had a number of mixed use buildings in our, in our residential neighborhoods. These would be old corner stores, first, first floor commercial, upper floor, you know, shop above um, that are in traditional residential neighborhoods. We've had about six or seven reinvigorated over the last few years. So these were places that were never built to be residential on the first floor, you know, big windows, really not good residential space that had been vacant for a number of years and because there's no minimum parking, they were able to reactivate um, as neighborhood amenities. Um, there's a pie shop in one, there's a there's a halal grocery store in one, they have there's a restaurant, um, there's some you know little corner stores that sell fresh fruits and vegetables and not cigarettes and tobacco. Um, so we've really been able to do that and allow those to integrate into some of our denser residential neighborhoods which is, I think, you know, I mean, we've had really good big successes, but like the little corner pie shop's way cuter. Yeah, I am lucky enough in Lexington to live around the corner from a location that sells um, 
fresh fruit and sandwiches and the best bread freshly baked in town. And I know it contributes to my quality of life to have access to those things. So it's inspiring to hear that people are getting uh, access to more food options uh, and delicious food, uh, pie, pie is so good. Um, so that that's a great tidbit. All right, who's up next, Nolan, Jimmy? Well, it's not pie, um, but carrying forward this theme of, of unsexy little changes that you see when you clear out parking requirements is all the little residential developments that, you know, in many cases on strange lots or uh, an underutilized space uh, that you see uh, in places that have eliminated these rules. Of course, and, and as some of the previous uh, speakers have mentioned, the adaptive reuse uh, in places like downtown Los Angeles um that has been able to happen because they cleared a lot of these rules is really exciting but a much smaller sort of thing that's happening here in california which is another initiative i know you all are working on is accessory dwelling units right um you know in many cases when they've cleared away some of these minimum parking requirements you know a lot of homeowners and a lot of folks said hey i could take my garage and turn that into a small uh, one bedroom or studio unit i can rent that out to you know, um, you know, maybe a student or a retiree and earn a little bit of extra income. And you see all this new housing being added to spaces that were really just kind of going to waste. And I think it's a really exciting thing to see. It makes our communities more diverse and dynamic and affordable. Yeah, thank you for that. I think for that ADU's um, accessory dwelling units are something that has been proposed in Lexington and moved through the planning commission and is now with council so we are optimistic that that can move forward and tie into the parking regulations potentially as well thank you nolan all right jimmy what you got uh well i was actually thinking of uh one thing that we did uh nearly 20 years ago now uh that was that was such a small thing but it actually had a a fairly large impact is that in, in Lexington, we have a lot of neighborhoods that have existing very small uh, residential lots, you know, a lot of 25 foot wide lots. And uh, as, as developers, and especially a lot of our faith-based uh, affordable housing developers, we're looking at getting some of those 25 foot wide lots and trying to rebuild them. Uh, they were getting caught with uh, some of our standard suburban parking requirements. And, and so these are neighborhoods that traditionally had on-street parking and didn't have parking spaces for those little lots. Uh, so we added in uh, one of the first kind of forays into parking. Uh, we added in an exemption or an exception into our zoning ordinance that if the properties never had a parking space, then you were essentially banked that one parking space on the street as meeting your parking requirement. And uh, that just really, that in addition to some other provisions that we did, you know, kind of promoting infill and redevelopment really led to an explosion of a lot of those faith-based housing uh, developments being able to be built and, and getting that land from very tiny vacant lots into useful production, productive places for people to live. Thank you. Yeah, it's neat to see how a, a little pilot can lead to bigger change when we see it successful. Uh, and I think we'll probably get into the B6P piloting in, in Lexington as well. But, but I'm hearing that as a theme that you change some things and then the neighbors and the community say that, that was good. Um, what else can we do? Um, so we've talked a little bit about some of the benefits already to neighborhoods, having access to food, seeing more mixed use development, um, being able to implement ADUs. Um, I'd like to turn more now to what's happening in the now. And the next question is related um, to the environmental benefits as well. Uh, so we already know that traditional parking requirements can incentivize large lots um, and then necessitate vehicle trips with the uh, negative impacts um, on humans, but also contributions to greenhouse gas emissions and urban heat island effect. Um, are you guys seeing any change in behavior and policy to protect the environment? Or are you seeing that uh, the communities are looking at that as a reason to move forward with parking change? The in Buffalo, um, along with our, our removal of no minimum parking standards, 
Um, we did incorporate minimum bicycle parking standards. Um, so a private development has to include a certain number of short term, which are outside parking, bike parking spaces and long term, which are more sheltered or inside of a building parking spaces through bike lockers or lock, you know, rooms or accommodations and apartments for bikes, um, a number of ways to meet it. So that's one of the things that we did to try to turn that into, you know, nobody's going to ride a bike somewhere if they don't have it somewhere safe to store it, we realized. Um, and then, and also um, as an environmental benefit, or we've tried to, in our parking design uh, requirements, um, push green infrastructure and um, really try to um, get people to do that. Um, sorry. Um, so that's, um, uh, so green infrastructure, the city of Buffalo requires uh, stormwater management at disturbance of a quarter acre of land where most of New York State is a full acre of land. So by reducing that threshold um, with our sewer authority, we we require people to manage more stormwater after they've done construction than before, but then by also incorporating green spaces within parking and trying to encourage green infrastructure, we're trying to we're trying to get a lot of things for one in one. So removing minimum parkings, but if you're putting in parking, make it green. And if it is green, make it green infrastructure and put in bike parking. So we really tried to layer a lot of things to get some environmental benefits and still allow for the flexibility of no minimum parking. That's great. Um, you, you know, I think this is a really interesting question uh, for, for a couple of reasons. And one of those reasons, Nolan, I, I, hope, I hope maybe you might talk about because I, the science that I've seen out of the planning, se that planning sector recently shows that um, maybe parking uh, has a causal relationship with, with, with driving. And if, if anybody here, you know, feels like they can talk a little bit more about that, I'd, I'd personally be interested to hear more. Um, for, for us, you know, we, we repealed the parking minimums on a, on a, um, almost on a, a market basis for our, for our arguments. So our, our, our claim that was successful was that developers and tenants and, and end users know how much parking they need more or less. And um, the banks are, are typically being a pretty risk averse uh, stopgap for, for making sure that too little parking doesn't get created for users. And that was a winning argument for, for our council members. In Fayetteville, you know, we, I, I think we have this kind of self-identity that we're um, a, a progressive city who really cares about climate change. Uh, but even five or six years ago, I, I, I think it's, it's important to note how much attitudes are changing and how rapidly they're changing. Even five or six years ago, even in a city like, like Fayetteville, um, I, I think climate policy and doing things like this under the banner of climate policy would have been a hard link for most members in our community to accept. And I, I think that's just the fair uh, assessment of, of what people's perceptions were. But today it feels different. Today, I think people expect and are even demanding climate action and at a, um, with an enthusiasm or, or a commitment that isn't reflected yet in our uh, municipal bureaucracy at City Hall or, or in our elected and appointed officials, there really seems to be a lag in, in, my, in my estimation between what City Hall is willing to do and what the people actually want. And so I'm, I'm kind of looking forward um, to the next few years and, and what champions at City Hall uh, and in the community can get accomplished by, by working together on, under the banner of climate action. And I don't think that would have been successful even, even five or six or seven years ago, like, like it seems like it would be successful today. Maybe that means it's time for us to take on residential parking minimums. <laughs> it might mean that, it might mean that. Yeah, and I, th I think we are seeing that pretty much all the time. I'm having trouble thinking of a an example where what's good for the environment is bad for humans. Um, and that can be in the short term with good design that makes people want to inhabit a space and sit under a tree. Um, and definitely in the long term with the cumulative effects of reduced emissions. Uh, in Lexington, to, to speak a little bit to what you were just mentioning, um, maybe Jimmy, you can talk a little bit about um, green infrastructure 
in like adaptive reuse and, and open spaces. And then um, I think that also uh, bike infrastructure is being included in the proposal for parking changes as well. It, it is. Uh, one of the things that, that we're doing, uh, we are proposing to eliminate parking minimums uh, in Lexington. Uh, but the, the flip side of that is that we are actually recommending better design of those parking spaces whenever they come in. And part of that better design is to put pedestrians and transit and bicyclists up on an even keel with the uh, with our vehicular uh, ordinances. So uh, if even though we're not saying how many parking spaces that you have to provide, whenever you do provide those parking spaces, we want to make sure that they're designed correctly and that we are proposing a, uh, a minimum amount of bicycle parking that would be if you're going to provide parking, then you also have to provide bicycle parking. That kind of goes in in uh, lockstep with the fact that we've had a uh, we have a bicycle master uh, bicycle and pedestrian master plan uh, that went through and and kind of inventoried and prioritized prioritized you know kind of our transportation system for multimodal uh, types of developments. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to use the jargon, but for bikes and pedestrians and, and transit users, uh, people other than just uh, the sole person in their car. The other thing, uh, as far as environmental benefits, also, uh, you know, there is one of the things that we also did in our ordinance many years ago is that we also tried to look through our zoning ordinance and just remove barriers that we might have had towards the, the types of paving requirements that we had for parking, uh, because especially whenever Lexington uh, instituted a stormwater uh, user fee that's based off of, especially for commercial properties, it's based off of how much pavement you have on your lot. Uh, you have to pay a fee for dealing with that stormwater every year. And so, uh, there, there are kind of things that you can do and, and, and grants that you could that people could apply for through our uh, environmental uh, our environmental departments uh, to put in uh, permeable pavers and and other good things like that uh, that could long term reduce your over you know that monetary incentive to to do the to do the right thing for the environment. So there's lots and lots of little things that we've done throughout over the years, but. There's also the the bigger picture of, like you said, reducing emissions and and like Matthew was saying, you know, there is uh, Todd Lippman kind of had it best in his cycle of auto dependency. You know, whenever you plan for cars, you're going to get more cars, and then then you're going to need more parking, which means that you have to move your land uses farther apart to take care of those parking spaces, which means that you need more cars to get there, which means you need more parking, and so it's this cycle of auto dependency and at some point you've got to break that cycle and I think that a really good place to do it is looking at the the parking minimums that that's that's helpful to hear I, that leads really well into a, another question that Nolan you might be able to kick us off on um that chicken and the egg comment um of okay um, do we get the infrastructure and then we can become less car centric or do we become less car centric and that motivates the infrastructure brings me to the question of um, what are signs that a community is ready to move away from traditional parking standards. Um, I could think of examples like in variances, for example, in um, the existence of multimodal infrastructure willingness of the community to use it, even if it's not where we want it to be. Uh, I'm sure there are, are numerous examples of that. Um, Nolan, can you kick us off on that one? Yeah, that's a great question. You hear it a lot. Um, you know, I, I would contend that that actually every community is ready to start phasing out these sorts of traditional minimum parking requirements. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of your familiar, a lot of your audience might already be familiar with how they work, but just to get back to basics, right? A minimum parking requirement says, if you want to build a home or an apartment or a townhouse, uh, you have to build so many parking spaces for that unit, regardless of what the developer thinks the market wants, or regardless of what the potential buyers or renters of that unit want, right? Um, so, in a market context you know, the developer has the incentives to get this question right and to make sure that there's not 
and under provision of parking. Um, and this is true too of commercial uses, right? So I might want to open a corner deli. I might be confident that most of my customers are going to walk, ride a bike or take a bus to my business. But a minimum parking requirement says to me, you don't have any choice in that. We're going to tell you how much parking you need to build, right? So eliminating these requirements just says, we're not gonna tell you that anymore. Um, you know, it's a whole separate discussion to talk about maximums, but you know, in the context of just removing a minimum, the city is just saying to folks, hey, it's up to you to decide how much you want to build. Um, if you do want to build it, we're going to have rules about how you can cite it, the materials you can use, so it has you know, as minimal an effect on the community as possible. So I would say even before you, know, you have a New York City style subway system, it's valuable to start the conversation about removing these requirements, right? Um, there's a certain number of people who already live in Lexington who might like to live uh, or, or don't need or simply can't even afford a car. Um, those people might, there are, you know, they might like to move into an apartment or a townhouse arrangement that's currently illegal with minimum parking requirements. Or there might be businesses that would be able to open in some of the underutilized uh, existing walkable context in places like downtown or you know, a place like uh, Wilson's Grocery in Kenwick, right? These are beloved institutions. People, uh, you know, when I lived in Kenwick, I'm exactly same as you, right? I, I love being able to walk to a corner uh, bakery or deli uh, and that didn't require that neighborhood being some kind of transit, transit rich uh, urbanist utopia. That was something that could just automatically start to happen. And so I would say that, you know, of course it is very important in the long term to be thinking about, you know, how do we make sure that everyone in the city feels safe walking and bicycling and has, you know, access to reliable and affordable transit. Those are super important conversations. And those are things also too that, you know, can be funded with some of the revenue raised by on street parking management. But I don't think you need to be, um, you know, in that utopian state to start having this conversation. And a lot of the places that have, have removed their minimum parking mandates successfully, they weren't there, but they're getting closer to becoming a, a much more uh, equitable and affordable place. Thank you. I, I like the way you said um, that you would argue that all places are ready for that. Um, I think that if we want to move forward, we have to <laughs> keep moving them forward um, and accept that if that's a need, which it is in society and for our environment as well, then we can do that. Um, any other thoughts on that, on the chicken and the egg and how we get the balls both rolling in the same direction? Or I guess the eggs. It's hard to roll eggs in the same direction, though. It's the Easter, Easter thing. They kind of roll all over the place. <laughs> Um, if I, I mean, I think that the conversation is that as we continue to require parking, those land uses do get farther apart. So if your goal is to have dense urban walkable neighborhoods and you have minimum parking requirements, you're having a mis mismatch in values, right? So you want er walkable places, but you also want to do as much to accommodate cars as possible. And since at every point in, tri in a trip where a pedestrian at some point, unless it's literally drive through back home. And even then you're walking at least on your own property. We are all pedestrians at some point. So, you know, taking the stance that we want walkable places where, you know, communities can mix and we're treating everybody who does and doesn't have a car and access to a car on a regular basis equally. I think that we, you have to start that value of deprioritizing cars and prioritizing people at some point to to start it because if you always accommodate the car you're never going to accommodate people first because you're always going to need more room for the car so it's it's you have to pick your value and it sounds like your comprehensive plan is try, has picked a value so now you know and as buffaloes did our comprehensive plan picked a value of people and so we moved towards that that was one of the bases we were able to use to remove our minimum parking I'm fascinated with, with, with this question and, and with the answers that we've heard so far. And, and what, I, what, what my mind keeps turning over in the last uh, few moments has been um, the, the role of, um, of, of champions and, and what a theory of change really looks like for a city. And uh, I, I have a really strongly held belief that it is a mistake. Um, and it, it's, it's a mistake that many cities repeat when they presume that they have to have explicit majority support before they make any attempts to, to change so something like this. Um, 
that is is not usually the case when we look at successful in initiatives. Usually, what we see are um, champions uh, taking a risk um, to advocate for for a particular solution or, or a particular action, and then um, spending a lot of time educating or even experimenting with, with with real policy to to prove the concept and 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 then expanding the proof of concept. And if if there's a sense that um, that that we have to uh, do the right kind of poll or or clear a certain threshold before we we experiment with these things, then really what you're setting yourself up for is a great excuse to say not yet. And uh, I th th this happens in cities across across the country, right? It's 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 kind of human nature to want to have it figured out before we actually start tr start trying to figure it out. Um, so my advice would be take a risk and, and figure out a way to take a, a small risk. And maybe that's with a pilot district or with a sunset clause. Um, but, but you need to do, you need to do something that, that can prove the concept. If that's something that you feel like you're, that, that you absolutely have to do in the culture of your community. And, and I, and I think that, um, one of the important things that, that has to be expressed over and over again is that when we talk about repealing parking minimums, and, and I think Nolan's point here really needs to be underscored, um, repealing parking minimums isn't about ending parking or new parking for your city. It's right, it's about creating new options for, for people who want to do work in your city. And I think what people forget is um, we want to know the answer and we forget that it's really hard to imagine how much could happen if we make a, a change in policy like this. Um, you have no idea, especially if you're just an interested member in the community, but even if you're a planner sitting in the, in the offices clerking inquiries, you, you have no idea how many people do a little bit of research about a venture they, they want to take on and they read the rules and they do a little scenario planning and they say, you know what, this isn't gonna work. I'm not even gonna make the phone call. And you never hear from those people um, because you know, by and large, uh, people who wanna start ventures, you know, even if it, they're either very smart or very motivated, you know, and, or, and, and may, maybe both. And um, people who have su successful ventures have an attitude of they're, they're not going to give up um, and so they do the homework and they do the research. And if they run into a deal breaker, like parking often is, they, they don't even make the inquiry. You know, they move on to, to a new idea. And um, I think all of the small things that you don't even know about today, when, when you count them in the aggregate, it means something that's a lot bigger than just talking about one, one corner store being cool for, for one neighborhood. Um, that's, that's real economic development. And I, th I think if you want to unlock that, it's important for the city to commit, whether it's an experiment or, or, or kind of taking the whole thing on all at once, it's, it's not enough to repeal parking minimums. You really have to approach it from a, co a comprehensive perspective. Um, your public works department needs a standard street section that memorializes on-street parking as the standard. Um, for, for new construction. And you have to take these kinds of things on in, in every single department that touches development review and, and, and touches uh, reuse and, and new construction. And that provides a lot more opportunities, um, um, maybe for imagination, than just talking about a, a simple repeal of, um, of, of parking minimums. Um, so I, I'm fascinated by this question because I really believe cities cities don't change unless champions band together and, and take a risk in, in having a shared learning experience and a shared education with the community, but also a, a shared experiment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, so our comprehensive plan, our most recent comprehensive plan promotes a flexible yet focused approach to the future. Um, and I think that what we've been talking about here is one of the ways that can that can happen. Um, in parking regulation reform, it sounds like what we're looking at is ways to better distribute the resources that are already funded by public means so that they do benefit more in the community. We know that not everybody can drive or wants to drive or has the ability to drive, whether it's because they're 15 and they just want to 
go hang out with their friends in a park <laughs> or they're um, unable to use a car, or in my case, I, I, I prefer biking. Um, so it's good to hear that the benefits can not only be reaped by the, the, those users, but by the economy as well. Um, to the point about risk, I think that we are really lucky here in Lexington in that you guys and other places and, and others that aren't on this panel right now have already started to do this stuff and have already demonstrated the success of these projects where the ball is rolling faster and accumulating more snow as it rolls. Um, like, because snowballs get more snow. <laughs> um, so, so um, Jimmy, maybe uh, you can talk to us a little bit about some of the pilot work that's been done in, in Lexington, uh, in the B6P zone. And then um, I, I, I've been in Lexington since about 2012. And it's really been amazing to me to see the amount of bicycle infrastructure. So like these things in our community that are saying it's not only time, it's, it's past time. <laughs> Well, um, to start off, uh, just a little bit of context, our B6P zone, that is our planned shopping center zone. That's, uh, that's really the, uh, where we get our major shopping centers along our major arterials. Uh, and that zone uh, was originally, when it was originally written, was very much for, you know, the, the typical large suburban shopping center. Uh, but over the years, we, um, in about six years ago, we proposed a, a major overhaul of the regulations. Uh, we added in residential uses. Uh, we got rid of minimum parking requirements and, and put maximum parking requirements in that zone. Um, and what we've seen over the last six years is actually just a very slow kind of movement. We've not had to it's never been an issue since we passed the regulations of anyone coming up against their maximum parking requirements because what we've seen is very slow development. We've seen some proposals for more residential development, some more outlot development that that couldn't previously be done in, in our, you know, more suburban style shopping centers. So it's really kind of helped reinvigorate those shopping centers, but in a very slow kind of almost non-detectable type of manner. And that's a, that was kind of a, a question, you know, kind of a conversational question that I had for my other panelists. You know, where you've made some fairly major regulatory changes, what did you see in real life? Was it a, was it a slow change? Was it an overnight kind of change uh, in, in your built environment and how people operate? Because we're not trying to say parking is going away. Parking will still be there. Uh, we're just mostly concerned about the public health and safety of how that parking is designed when it is put in. Yeah, it, I, so I think that's a great question and I would love if you guys um, could respond to that. And uh, we have some questions in the Q&A that maybe we can tie into this one um, regarding um, how this content is transferable. Um, so like what makes the takeaways from other cities relevant for one another? How can we learn from each other? Um, so I'll jump in because um, the city of Buffalo's had no minimum parking across the city for four years now. So the changes we've seen are a few. So it's in, in, it's important to remember that development takes time. So a project that came in four years ago it's been operating for months now. So um, that change is slow. What has been fast measure is the adaptive reuse, the reuse of existing buildings. So those have been able to move really quickly. We're losing less building stock adjacent to adaptive reuse because they don't have to figure out how to accommodate for parking on the site by you know, buying adjacent buildings, knocking them down. So that's really allowing us more flexibility in the reuse of some of our historic manufacturing buildings for new uses, including residential in some places, mixed use. So that's that has been picking up steam, um, which has been great to see. Um, in our more new construction places, the biggest change has been in our affordable, larger affordable housing developments. That ha They have probably cut their parking spaces in half. They always wanted to provide about half of what was required, but because it was a zoning variance and nobody really wants to go to the zoning board for affordable housing in a residential neighborhood, you know, it's just another 
discretionary approval to avoid, they often built more parking than they ever thought they were going to need just to make the conversation go away, just to say they were following all the rules to, to take away a point of contention with the neighborhood. So they have been able to reduce parking to where they thought was viable and appropriate for the community, their residents, without impacts on the neighborhoods. And some of them are open and operating. Um, again, you know, it takes a long time to permit, construct, <laughs> um, and really start to see that results. But I think that in those cases, um, our affordable housing providers have gone significantly down in parking provided. Commercial parking providers have been about the same and our mixed use how and our mixed use developments have gone way down as well. So we actually had a professor from UB go through and look at this and it's had a you know some places are providing more than the minimum would have required before some are providing much less some are providing none. It's been a really mixed bag um and we haven't seen any real blowback from that and I will say that um, mixed with the uh, parking requirements, the design standards that are making sure that we prioritize pedestrians as they cross the, the sidewalk in front of the parking lot, the reduction of curb cut widths, the requirement that, you know, parking, the driveways go over sidewalks, not sidewalks go through driveways, you know, designs, little design changes that say pedestrians are supposed to be in this space, not, and cars are entering it rather than car, pedestrians are entering a car space really has changed the urban environment and made walkable places better. That's great. That's great. As, as we continue with this question, I wonder, Matthew, if you can talk a little bit about the um, effect on the neighborhoods um, related to the university. So we have the University of Kentucky um, in the middle of our county, and that has a, a pretty big role. Um, have you seen challenges with the areas around the university as we adjust or as you adjust to the parking changes? And, and how has that played out? Well, you know, in Fayetteville, um, those challenges are are created and growing when we have new uses constructed uh, on on campus or or adjacent to campus functions. For instance, fr fraternity and sorority houses, which, due to some anomalies in, in our code, um, are subjected to uh, odd requirements uh, uh, like boarding houses. And so that's a long way of saying that our repeal of, of commercial parking minimums in, in Fayetteville didn't really affect those issues. Um, but that's not to say that those issues aren't real. And so um, we've taken the approach of, of creating um, uh, residential parking districts or, or mixed, mixed public and re residential parking districts um, where we have done some really careful uh, public engagement and and uh, block by block block planning to try and figure out what is equitable for <clears throat> for those streets and for those blocks, not just for the residents, um, but also for the adjacent residents. Because usually, when we implement something like that, we're we're pushing the problem down the street, and unless we talk about that from the beginning. Um, so th th that was our approach with those with those districts, and and that that was. Um, that, that was a process where we ended up getting applauded for parking uh, new, new parking policy at at, at the end. Um, but I'm not sure it's really related to the you're sprinkling all over your community. I want I want us to get an applause for, for I'm not involved in the parking actually, but uh, that that's fantastic to hear. Sorry to interrupt. Could please go ahead. No, we'll 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 keep this up, and maybe you will. And um, uh, you know what I think is really interesting by the original question, you know, how do we know what is done in other cities is relatable to our city? I'm always, I'm always fascinated by this question. I mean, uh, Fayetteville is is in the south, um, but barely, uh, and um, but you know, just like every other city in the south or the Midwest or on the East Coast, you know, uh, we talk about how we're different than Portland and we're di we're different than Seattle and we're di we're different than anywhere else who has done anything that we think we might want to do. Um, and you know, it's it's uh, fascinating to me because um, I look around and uh, you know the the things that we want in life that that we want. Um, uh, that, that we take happiness in, uh, that, that we find joy in, the things that, that make us frustrated, those aren't any different from city to city. And you know what, um, 
cities really aren't that different. Uh, you know, your main street might have um, s some some different buildings that you cherish for, for their history or for what's what, what's occupying them today. But, you know, more or less, they look the same as the buildings on the main street in the other town. And the, the houses more or less look the same and the neighborhood streets and the grids, they're they're the same. And, um, you know, they're, they're same in all the ways that they're, they're same and the ways that they're different are um, are are mostly surface um, or in the ways we have our, our own personal individualized experiences. They're, they're not they're not really different at the level of the municipality or the economic or, or social inflows and outflows of, of, of the uh, of the different districts and in, in the different neighborhoods. Um, so it's almost like they're unique in their branding, but but maybe not in their fundamentals or, or they're a little bit different in their cultural expectations, but but not in the fundamentals. And, you know, I, th I think that there's a tendency sometimes in cities to substitute uh, process for expertise. And, um, you know, certainly in Fayetteville, we're really guilty of this, where we presume that if we undergo the, the correct planning process of public engagement and, and, and diligent reflection and revision and so on and so forth, we presume we're going to end up with a really good solution. Um, but really, that's only true on the political dimension. It, it doesn't help. It, it doesn't help us achieve a great technical solution. And I think for a city like Lexington, there's a lesson to be learned from these other cities where you really have to accept that there is something to expertise. And there, there is something to lessons that have been learned in other cities and the, and the expert analysis that that, um, that that follows up with those. And that has to be legitimized and combined with your processes for public engagement and, and, and for the shared education, why you need to make some of these changes. And I, I think for Lexington, there, you've already got some examples that you can really rely on to do that. I mean, when you have faith-based developers who are struggling with narrow lots and you can pinpoint parking, that, that is a, a motivating example and something that other communities have dealt with directly. Um, and I, I think that if you dive in, you'll find a lot of examples where you have um, uh, expertise that you can borrow from, from other cities who have, who have been through this and, and far, not, not the panel that's here today, but, but the, there are a lot of cities that, um, that, that have some lessons to share. And if you can uh, trust that your planning department in, in Lexington is doing a really diligent job of trying to filter and, and sort, sort those things for their applicability. You need to start with that and then build a process around, uh, around the facts and, and around the likely outcomes to, to try and um, uh, suss out what the real differences are for Lexington in, instead of just the assumed differences. And, and I think that's the, 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 real, um, the real answer to your question is um, you shouldn't assume that there are differences about your city. You should try to find them and, and be honest with yourself about what they are, but you also need to accept that there's probably a lot more that is the same um, that, that maybe you don't want to admit. Thank you. In Lexington, also, we're growing. Most cities are. There are some exceptions to that, but but most cities are growing, and Lexington is definitely growing. It's a challenge that we're facing. So I think it's really great to look to other examples of cities that are bigger and also growing and see what they're doing, um, because we can avoid repeating some of the same mistakes. <laughs> so it's better to be like the younger siblings. You'd be like, oh, well, I'm not going <laughs> to do those things that my older sister or sibling did um, in a lot of cases. Well, this goes into a, a, another question really well. Um, so we've been talking about traditional methods of parking and um, how we assess parking uh, based on things like land use, um, low density development, um, free parking for, for cars. Um, and, and what we're seeing is what we've discussed already. We have more sprawl, we have more parking than we need in most cases, and amenities are inaccessible to a huge chunk of the population that can't access those by those more traditional car-centric methods. Um, so new research is supporting uh, removing land use as a factor in parking policy. Um, so maybe you guys can speak to um, some factors that communities are looking to as better indicators of parking need? Um, how do you determine perhaps like as a, a developer, how much parking you need? If there are no maximums and there are no minimums, what do you use to guide 
what is appropriate for your business model and the community that you're within and the, the niche area that you're trying to develop a parcel within. It's kind of a loaded question. Nolan, are you about to jump in? Yeah, well, I just wanted to quickly jump in on the Lexington being different question. Please, yeah, I go mean, ahead. I, I, so I, like you said, I'm born and raised there. I know Lexington is a special place, right? Um, but the irony I think of this discussion is that Lexington's current parking policy is basically like the vanilla out of the box parking policy. Like the current policy is basically what every other sort of city that's not really doing anything is enforcing. I, I would imagine that if you compared Lexington's current minimum parking requirements to any other mid-sized city in America, they probably would be basically comparable, right? So like the current status quo policy is that Lexington has this sort of out of the box um, vanilla policy that frankly probably was never that carefully calibrated to the actual city's needs, right? So I think now here you have a really good chance to actually, you know, if we want to develop a policy that works specifically for Lexington and, and eliminate some of these rules that might have made sense in a particular context in the 30s or 40s when a lot of these ordinances were written for, you know, some other city, maybe, you know, in some state over, um, you know, now's the chance to really look at Lexington and say, what does Lexington need right now? And what does Lexington need to be uh, the city that we want it to be. And that's the conversation that I see happening right now. And, you know, if you want to talk about a city being special, keeping your keeping your existing parking requirements is not going to keep your city special. If anything, it's going to make your city more and more like every other um, sort of sprawling American city right now. And, and to follow up on that, you know, one of the things that we did whenever we were looking at our, our regulations is that, and I'm a firm believer that planners should be able to explain why we regulate things, right? If we're going to be regulating property, we should be able to explain what's in our zoning ordinance. And whenever we look at our zoning ordinance, almost all of our zones, almost all of our things had, you know, an intent statement. You know, this is what we're trying to achieve. But uh, we've had zoning since about 1930, so about 90 years of our, of our zoning ordinance. And we've never had an intent statement on what we were trying to achieve with our parking regulations. You know, we've always just gone straight into regulating parking. We've never said what we're trying to achieve. So that's another big part of our regulations that we're proposing now is to, is to set not just one single intent statement, but also to kind of set the overall goal. And then in different sections of that, of our proposed ordinance, we've got many uh, miniature, many uh, intent statements that kind of says, this is the goal that we're trying to achieve with these regulations. And I think that that's really good on being clear, uh, not just for regulatory intent or anything like that, but it kind of sets the goal that if in the end, our regulations are not achieving the goal that we said that, that we set out to achieve, then we can go back and look at it because zoning is the tool that we use to try and implement our plans, not, not the other way around. We don't set our comprehensive plans and be the city that we wanna be because these are our existing zoning rules. I might, I might uh, uh, try to answer your, your question, uh, Lauren, and um, maybe I can say a little bit about uh, in, intent to, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things about intent that, that you can go after, and maybe it's a combination of these things that is that is salient for your elected officials and for your community. Maybe your intent needs to be to um, improve turnover or reduce uh, indirect stormwater costs associated with impervious surfaces, or 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 a combination of those things, or, or maybe it's simply um, to make to make streets and, and, and sidewalks safer for people who are traversing them in, a, in other modes. You know, there, I think there are a number of things that you can do. Um, the, the question about how developers think through this is, um, it's interesting to me and, and something I've had to do. I, I developed a, uh, a small mixed use project, uh, nine apartments, a, a smoothie bar and a, and a tap room. And um, we put it in a great location. It's, it's adjacent to the downtown proper. Uh, it's next to a bike trail uh, and et cetera, et cetera. But there wasn't really, when we did it, any, anything else around there. Um, and th there is now. Uh, but whenever we did it, we had a, a 0.2, a 0 0.2 acre site 
that we wanted to put this 10,000 square foot building on um, with these apartments and uh, parking drives the design. I mean, period. When, you, when you're dealing with uh, any kind of uh, parking need, even if it's not required, parking still drives a huge part of the design. And for anybody on this call, especially elected officials or appointed officials that, that doesn't believe that, do the role play download a pro forma for a small multifamily rental property and uh, open up, uh, you know, get a sheet of paper and, and a marker and look up a parcel in your city, a, a typical parcel and draw it out and actually go through the exercise of trying to fit that building on that parcel uh, with the parking in a way that still makes enough money to at least pay the bank back. And um, yeah, I, I teach that exercise for the Incremental Development Alliance, a nonprofit all over the country. And so many people don't believe that until we actually do the exercise. And then, then they're doing the developer's pose and, sh and shaking their heads throughout the exercise, trying to figure out you know, why, they, wh why they didn't get that to begin with. But it's absolutely true. It takes up, too, it takes up so much space and so that's what developers are thinking of in a in an efficient parking lot of, of parking, you know, uh, with multiple bays and, and 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 drive lanes, which is the most efficient you can do parking. You're still spending at least 325 square feet of land on every single one of those parking spaces, and that's if you have a perfect perfectly geometrical site for, for designing parking. Um, usually, it's a lot more than that, 350 or even 400 square feet. And our parking requirements are usually written, a typical park parking requirement for a city like Lexington says, if you've got 300 square feet of retail or 300 square feet of, of shop space, you have to provide one parking space for every 300 square feet, which means more, more parking than retail space is the rule, is the law, is a requirement in a lot of cities. Um, and when you actually do the development math, it's, it, it makes you go crazy because you can't figure it out on the investment side or on the site planning side, just in terms of the, of the geometries. So what developers like me are thinking about whenever they're deciding how much parking it to, to put in a particular project, they're looking at, it's all about location, but it's, in, in, it's location in two different dimensions. The first is what is already around my site. So if I've got a thousand households in walking distance around my site, I probably don't need anything more than street parking for a typical commercial business, whether that's service oriented, whether it's uh, uh, food and beverage, um, or, or whether it's, it's, it's uh, the sale of goods. But there's another dimension. If that's the only uh, commercial district or the only active district in the city where my project is, that means everyone in the city that wants my service or, or my, my goods is going to come to my location. And so now it's not just about what's around me, it's about how there's no other walkable locations in the city. And so now I'm, I'm, I have to look at parking demand on these two dimensions. What's around me? And are there other places like this in the city? And if I'm kind of in the only hot spot, um, then I'm kind of forced, or I feel like I'm forced by the market to, to provide more parking than maybe would strictly be required if we had other, other places um, where, where parking was a little bit more relaxed or, or was a little more walkable. Um, so I, I think from a city perspective, it's really important to look at not just the impacts for a particular use case, but also um, wh what are the impacts if we only have uh, one walkable area or, or one area where we're focused on parking reform because it really turns that um, in, into you know, the sole destination and then it becomes a regional calculus uh, e even more than it, might, than it might be a neighborhood calculus. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we are at an hour and I am so excited to say that we are not ending yet. Um, and we get to talk for about another 20 minutes. Normally I'm like hustling as of 15 minutes ago to try and squeeze in as much as I can. And that'll probably still happen in about 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, but this conversation has been great so far. And so I just wanted to say to uh, attendees who are watching, these normally are one hour, uh, but today we're, we get to go a little bit longer. Um, so uh, continuing that, that conversation, um, 
on what Matthew was just saying to kind of riff on that a little bit. Jimmy, I wonder if you mind to talk about um, the, okay, so in Lexington, we were facing many obstacles um, and we're trying to set the stage for that flexible yet focused, more dense, better designed development. And there are many approaches to doing that. One of those is the, the parking regulations that we're looking at. Um, but to the point of um, parking being such a driver and parking requirements being such a driver for like what's possible on a small lot or in an area, um, how does that tie into other things that we've been doing? This more multi-prong approach with things like FAR and open space and mm -hmm. bicycle parking and all of these other things that we're trying to do. Well, it really is. I mean, the if you think about it, the three things that, that a, a designer of any project, and Matthew kind of hit on it, that you have to think about, the things that take up land are uh, your building, your parking, and your open space. And those three things kind of, you know, work together to kind of define, you know, how you can develop the lot. The, essentially, they create the glass box that you can build within. And um, so, Lexington has already uh, addressed uh, the floor area ratios. We kind of looked at our floor area ratios and we've upped them a little bit because amongst our many different zones, and I'm sure we're not different than many other cities, we've got lots of zones with small differences between the different zones. We've kind of looked at and tried to uh, increase the amount of floor area, the amount of building that you can build on a, on a property but it was still getting caught by the, it's still getting caught by the parking requirements, right? You, you might be allowed to build more building now, but you still can't meet the minimum parking requirements. And so that's one of the things that we're really trying to do. And, you know, how much parking a use needs isn't usually, you know, it's the popularity of the, of the particular use. It's the users that are going there. And, like Matthew was saying, it, it has a lot to do with the location of where it's located and all of these things that you can't really measure in a zoning ordinance. You know, you can't really say this is something that's going to be important. So we, we're trying to focus on what is important, you know, and trying to ensure that parking is truly accessory to the use of the property, you know, so that in both function and design so that it's not the primary visual thing that you see whenever you walk up into uh, onto a property. We started off today's conversation with everybody, you know, kind of uh, reminiscing about their favorite corner grocery store in the neighborhood, but I don't didn't hear anybody talking about their favorite corner parking lot in their neighborhood. <laughs> you know, that's just, and, and whenever I go to other cities, I, I don't come back and go, oh, that city was so great. They're their parking was so good. I just wanted to stay in my parking spot the entire time I was in the city. You know, it's it's one of those things that people overlook because it's just there. It's become so ubiquitous in our nation that people don't really think about it until you have to think about it. And and so and and the last thing that we're doing, you know, in that kind of triumvirate is is open space. You know, we're really trying to look at uh, really kind of defining what is a usable open space, something that, you know, not just a tiny little strip of green grass that doesn't do anybody any good. You know, we're really trying to look at uh, rethinking how we're going to do those open space. So I think that will probably be the next really big kind of watershed change that, that Lexington will be looking at is kind of how we regulate that. And we're going to approach it with the same type of, you know, kind of same type of thought of getting back and looking at are our open space regulations really accomplishing the goals that we intended for them to set out. So, oh, and uh, one follow up on the, you know, kind of the timing. You know, you know that you know, parking was for the, for the example of the small lot residential development and the faith-based housing. Uh, you know, we did a, uh, a, a vacant and underutilized survey of most, uh, I think all of Fayette County at one point in the early 2000s. And we went back three years later and we met with our, uh, a lot of our affordable housing providers and we talked to them, you know, what is stopping you from being able to develop these things? 
and uh, and parking was one of the number one things that they kept coming back to us with. Uh, we changed our parking regulation. We kind of let everybody know. We kind of let reached out to our affordable housing providers, and then three years later, whenever we went back to kind of resurvey uh, some of those vacant and, and underutilized residential lots about 70, 75% of those lots had new houses on them. So I really think that, you know, in a three-year turnaround, and I, and I think Nadine would probably agree with this, that, you know, in a three-year turnaround to get that much uh, new development was really, that was the trigger. That was the stopping point, that parking requirement. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. Um, I do have an example of a uh, parking lot being used <laughs> in a non-parking way. Um, it's kind of a funny example, though. I, I had to go up to Michigan for a family emergency last week, and, and uh, Michigan's colder than here, so it's like spring and beautiful in Kentucky right now, but it's cold <laughs> in Michigan. And so my mom and I pulled off to like take a driving break along the way, and we pulled off in this ginormous um, like stadium lot. Um, so it was just like, like just huge amounts of parking lot and like fresh blacktop. And there was a woman laying on a picnic blanket by herself in this huge empty lot with me and my mom, like a mile away, not really a mile, but maybe a half a mile away in the same lot, mind you. And I think she was sunbathing. She was doing yoga. I think she was trying to get the warmth from the blacktop. But it still just seemed just like a, a, a lot of uh, wasted space. Uh, that actually ties in well to a question we have in the chat as well or in the Q&A. Um, about parking reform on UK campus. And I'm just going to respond to it real quick. Um, the um, Lexington planning doesn't really have oversight over that kind of thing, but uh, parking and transportation services at the University of Kentucky would be a good group to reach out to. Um, and I know they have recently uh, expanded their use of parking structures. So they've been trying to build more parking structures to get more parking and free up more of their space for uh, better uses. Uh, and they've also been heavily pushing uh, multimodal infrastructure. So they have some of the best bicycle infrastructure in the city and they are doing things like um, they're trying to incentivize their employees and their students to not drive by offering them, I think it's like $400 vouchers for bicycle shops in exchange for a parking permit. Um, so it's really neat to see the way that these large organizations can uh, have such an impact and how the private side um, can really make a big impact on public infrastructure. And I think UK is a really great example of taking different approaches to to um, to meeting the needs of our developing community. Um, any other comments on what we've been talking about so far? Or would you like me to move on to a next question? We still have plenty of questions. <laughs> move on? OK, OK, I'm going. Um, let's see here. It's so hard to choose when there are so many good questions. Um, let's talk about political will a little bit more. We've talked about that some already. Um, the role of political will is so, so critical for regulation advancement, um, and it's often really tenuous. Um, it, it gets complicated when we're trying to combine um, non-political sides with political sides and recognize that we're a democracy and we need to move things forward in a way that's, that's good for all. Uh, but it, it can also be quite tenuous. So my question here is, um, how does the community garner so the support they need to get the changes over the finish line so that we can start seeing the important impact of effective policy, knowing that it's not going to be immediate? Um, three years sounds like a quick turnaround. Um, so the sooner that we can do this, the better. Uh, so if anybody has any thoughts on political will, that would be helpful, I'm sure, for the audience. Matthew, I don't know if you want to get us started on there. Oh, Nadine, please go ahead. <laughs> I was actually going to build off of something Matthew said earlier, actually, if that helps. Um, so in <laughs> Buffalo, we really did have champions who were strongly in favor of no minimum parking at the beginning of our zoning rewrite. So we had a group of champions really pushing to a form-based code and no minimum parking. And they kept doing that public engagement from their side and pushing the their advocacy into the zoning code 
from the beginning of the process, which was a seven year process. So we had these, you know, champions from within our community pushing it. And then it took um, our mayor, Mayor Brown had leadership that he bought into the vision of the no minimum parking and worked with our council, um, we, that's our, our mayor, our structure, to, under, to help make sure that the administrative staff was available to work on the process they felt necessary. So um, we had citywide meetings, we had neighborhood meetings, and then as the code was introduced to the common council, each common council member then wanted to have meetings in each of their nine council districts. And so the administrative staff was made available to go to as many meetings as the council members wanted in as many neighborhoods as they wanted during the review process to help explain. I mean, we were doing an entire rewrite, so very, you know, bigger picture. But we, you know, I think at one point we counted, we did 32 meetings in 48 days or something, just because you know, council members thought that this neighborhood was slightly different than this neighborhood. And so going and explaining and I'll be honest, some of the champions followed us around and, you know, they showed up at every meeting and made sure that they made the point when the question came up and they helped it. But I think it was a combination of the grassroots, well, the champions that really thought this stuff was important, you know, convincing some of the leadership structure and then making available the resources to make sure everyone bought into the concept. So it's a multi-pronged issue with, you know, good research and all of that, but I didn't, I don't think it was one specific easy answer. It just took a lot of forces coming together and a lot of talking. A lot of talking. And thanks for that. I do, <clears throat> excuse me. I do want to plug um, something I saw come through my email this upcoming week in Lexington. There's Fayette Alliance is going to be hosting a series of virtual meetings by council districts. So if people in Lexington are interested in those, I would encourage you to go to the Fayette Alliance website. It's it's not for parking specific. It's it's more general, but it could be a really neat way to to get more in touch with your council district. And we'll have planning staff there, kind of like passively listening, so we can get a better feel for things. So thank you for that, Nadine. Uh, Matthew, I think you were about to jump in there. Uh, yeah. Um... Well, as a as a council member, uh, building political will, I feel like is the number one thing I have to I have to think about on on each issue that that I try to take up. And um, I'm not sure parking is really all that all that different than than other issues. Um, and I, I think a lot of people that are involved in in city government or or as advocates at, just outside of government. Um, struggle with this question about what does the roadmap uh, actually look like to to build political will and um, there's there's there are in fact reliable processes that you can follow to do that um, so it, it, it definitely is important um, the things that have already been said um, that I said earlier that, that Nadine just highlighted about about finding champions and about actually putting in the work. Um, and, and there, there's a way to do that. And, and so I, I feel, um, pretty strongly that there are two things that, that are maybe fundamental to, to building political will. Um, the first is, uh, as a city or as a department, you have to embrace enthusiastic citizens and, and cultivate your relationships with them. So I, I think it's really easy to get a cynical attitude and to cultivate a cynical attitude and say, well, these people are just, that, that's just who they are. And you know, that's their passion project, um, but they're never really gonna pull it together. And um, so we can keep going on with the job we have to do. And you know, I've, heard, I've heard some version of that about one issue or another, um, especially highly controversial issues uh, in, in almost every city that, that I've, uh, been honored to work in. But if you can flip the script on that and you can say, you know what, this person has a raw enthusiasm for what we're trying to do. And, you know, regardless about the details, which they might get right or they, or they might get wrong, if we could tap that enthusiasm and, and really direct that energy, then you would have an asset. So in, in cold calculating, let's build political will terms, you need to identify and cultivate your assets that are really going to help you do that work that, that has to happen and all those conversations that have to happen. Um, 
And, and I think that is just born from a reckoning that you can't be everywhere at once. You don't have enough staffers. You don't have enough people. There, there are just too many people in the city um, for, for you to reach that you can't rely on traditional channels. Uh, you can't rely on broadcast. You, you must identify and cultivate those relationships and turn people into assets for, for what you're trying to do. And you have to do that in a legitimate way, right? I'm calling them assets right now because we're on like this technical panel and we're, we're, just, we're just talking about, um, you know, in kind of an academic way how this stuff works. But you have to have real relationships with these people and, and you have to direct their energy on a weekly or a biweekly basis. Um, uh, to, to really advance uh, the political will. The second thing that you have to do, um, and maybe this proceeds uh, 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 before you really uh, uh, cultivate your champions, or maybe it happens in parallel or in an ongoing way, but um, literally uh, map out, uh, draw a constellation of the people who are already interested in this for one reason or another. Um, for instance, draw out a map with lines between the different names of the people who have been involved in faith-based development of narrow parcels in Lexington. And not just that, but who were their bankers? Who were their appraisers? Who were the contractors and the tradespeople on the project? And then extend that map from those new links. And so you end up with something that looks like a star chart, that looks like a constellation of actors in your city. And you know, you can you can do that to find new angles and new inroads with people that need to be convinced. So maybe you've got, you know, whether it's a national level or a state level or the local, anytime you try to do something like this, there's always one or two uh, uh, insistent people who have to be convinced before the thing can move forward. Always, right? It, it doesn't matter what the issue is. It doesn't matter what level of government it is. There's always one or two people that you have to change their minds uh, to move forward. And the people who are already interested may not be the people who are able to do that. Um, they might not have the, the cachet or the right relationship or whatever it is. And that's just the way the world is. But maybe you can, through this mapping exercise, find out who does have the right angle. Maybe it's the Urban Land Institute. Maybe it's the lending community. Maybe it's the faith-based community. Maybe it's neighborhood advocates who want a little something different in, in their neighborhood. But if you do that mapping exercise, you end up with the, um, you, you end up with a team that you can actually start to, to organize and to, and to run plays with uh, to build that political will. Thank you for that. Um, for the type A people like myself out there, um, the I think that mapping activity is a great idea. And I also would recommend looking at um, stakeholder charts um, that can be really helpful in assessing like the role that somebody plays and um, their interest and then effective way, like charting out effective ways of engaging with those particular stakeholders. Um, we are almost at the end. Time just flew by. 20 minutes was like two minutes. Jimmy, do you want to chime in there and then we'll wrap I, it up? I do, especially, and I want to make sure that I get this point across. Lexington is early in this process. We have, uh, you know, we have put forward a, a, a public draft of our draft regulations, but I really want to uh, stress that this is our first draft. You know, we're beginning uh, this, today's webinar is really a kickoff of our public engagement. Uh, we've we've got websites, we've got surveys, we've got a lot of different things, but really, uh, ultimately, what we're doing is that we're, I see these uh, regulatory changes as, as empowering choice, you know, a, empowering responsive parking and parking that is responsive to the context of the use and the context of the neighborhood that it's in. So really, this is, I just wanted to kind of get across, this is something that, you know, we've we have put forward some regulations out there, but this is our first draft. This is the starting point for the conversation. That's great. All right, I'd like to wrap up with a final question um, with just some brief answers uh, so that we can end this in time for the next airing since we have a spot on Lex TV. Hi, everybody who's watching from Lex TV. Um, so the final question that uh, for each of you, please, uh, would be what guidance or words of wisdom or encouragements do you want to leave the audience with as our communities and our society comprised of our communities 
strive to move forward in a better way for all modes and ages of and preferences of life and transportation. Um, jump on in. <laughs> no pressure. Well, I think I'll, I'll start with this one. Uh, I think that, you know, one of the things that we learned during the pandemic is that, you know, cities need to be responsive to whatever kind of disruptions that are coming forward. So if we have rigid requirements, then we're not very responsive to uh, restaurants that needed to move their seating to outdoors, you know, because we had to pass those kinds of things. So whenever we're focusing more on people and less on a number of parking spaces, I think that will long-term make our city more sustainable and responsive to this and future disruptions. Um, my advice would be don't give up. If you're wondering right now how long it's gonna take, the answer is it takes as long as it takes unless you give up. And, and, and then it's over. And I, um, that's true for parking and it, it's true for all the rest of it. Um, so celebrate the small wins and um, don't let the failures on the way uh, get you down. You're definitely going to have failures on the way, but um, make sure you don't give up and, and you will succeed at this. Um, I guess mine would be try to think of your city for the little kid you were, the teenager you were, and the old lady I'm going to be. And I think if you can design a city for those two people, you can design a city that works for everyone. Since I'm coming here from UCLA, home of Donald Shoup, I, I feel the need to just reemphasize uh, the free parking isn't free. Uh, when, you, when you mandate parking, um, projects that might not otherwise have had it are gonna end up more expensive. The housing is gonna be more expensive. Um, businesses that might not have um, you know, been able to accommodate parking are not going to exist. Um, you know, and I know that we talk a lot about the economic development, but frankly, every time I go back to Lexington, I hear about the lack of starter homes. I hear about Lexington getting more and more unaffordable. Um, and so, you know, as part of a broader conversation on the housing affordability element, I think this is really low hanging fruit and Lexington's not operating in the dark here. You guys have a lot of really comparable cities that have experimented with this and there are lessons to be learned. And I think it's just really exciting that it's it's on the on the docket, and and I think uh, you know some really neat things are going to come from it. That's those are great words to wrap this up with. Thank you, each of you. Um, if you're in the audience and watching, now's a really good time to click on all those links that Valerie's been dropping in there, full of useful, helpful information. Um, we did have a lot of questions today that we were not able to get to even with my desired 90 minute segment. So do consider reaching out if you have any questions, whether it's to planning staff here in Lexington um, or people further away or um, whoever you need to reach out to, don't give up. I think that's a really good point, Matthew. It's a really good point. Uh, as a reminder, if you're seeking AICP credits, this session is eligible. Um, to catch this webinar again, uh, you can see it re-streaming on Lex TV this Saturday at 1 p.m. And that's on that's available online globally as well. Um, and you can visit our website at imaginelexington.com to see the recording. I want to thank again each of the panelists, Matthew, Nolan, Nadine, and Jimmy. This has been a really excellent conversation. I'd also like to thank Chris Woodall for coordinating uh, live Q&A support from Valerie Friedman, technical support from Libby Jefferson, and today special Lex TV support from Chris Edwards. And as always, thank you to our audience. Thank you for coming and being present with us. Um, the Mornings with Planning webinar series will continue to discuss new ways to reconnect, reimagine, and respond in a new reality. And we want to hear from you. Uh, what topics should we discuss as we move Lexington forward together? Email us at imagine at lexingtonky.gov to let us know. We will be back on the first Wednesday of next month, May 5th, where we will be discussing stormwater. For more information on future sessions, to access the recordings from this webinar previously, and to learn more about planning in Lexington, visit imaginelexington.com or lexingtonky.gov forward slash planning and follow us on social media. Thank you for spending your morning with us and we will see you next time.